Mecca is of course the most holy site in Islam, but in 1979, a group of Islamists took over the mosque and completely changed the course of Saudi Arabian history. The country would become incredibly more conservative afterwards, and they banned women from doing many things. Plus, the whole thing was witnessed by a young Bin Laden, who became even more radical. Now, it may be hard to believe today, but the rebels thought that Saudi Arabia was a little too liberal. In the words of the rebel leader, the ruling Al Saud dynasty had lost its legitimacy because it was corrupt, ostentatious, and had destroyed Saudi culture by an aggressive policy of westernization. The whole thing was orchestrated by a man named Juhamain al Otaibi, who believed that he had found the redeemer of Islam, and wanted to revive the religion, bringing it back to its roots. So this was more than just a political movement. The people who attacked Mecca believed that the world was coming to an end, and they needed to prepare. But first, lapses in security are clearly very important. Cyber criminals are getting more and more skilled and pose a greater threat than ever before. Meanwhile, our passwords are sometimes the only thing keeping these criminals away from our info and finances. Thankfully, NordPass is on hand. NordPass, however, is more than just a password manager. It's the essential cybersecurity tool that makes everyone's life easier and safer. However, if you get NordPass, you don't have to worry about remembering a bunch of complex passwords as NordPass stores all of your passwords in one place, and its autofill feature actually makes signing in a lot quicker than before. So you can actually shop and browse faster, as they also secure credit card details for instance, and their data breach scanner identifies where and when a leak may have happened, and what data could be compromised. So join 14 million users by going to nordpass.com jabsy, or just click the link in the description. Once you're there, use the code JABZY and secure yourself online today with NordPass. So, millenarianism is the belief that the world is ending and people need to claim authority on land in order to prepare for the new age. So, this is nothing new, and my favourite historic group are the Fifth Monarchists, who were extreme Puritans. They followed the prophecy in Daniel, believing that the four ancient monarchies of Rome, Macedonia, Persia, and Babylon would all proceed to the kingdom of Christ. And like many similar groups, they cared a great deal about numbers. So they believed 1666 would bring about the end of the world, or at least the world being ruled by humans. So in 1661, Thomas Venner led a group of fifth monarchists in a rebellion, declaring London was now in the possession of King Jesus. But only 50 people took part, and it was promptly crushed. Yet, some began to believe more in their teachings when, in 1666, there was a great plague, and of course, the Great Fire of London. But onto Mecca. al was part of the elite of Najd, and his grandfather joined Ibn Saud, the unifier of Saudi Arabia, back on his campaigns in the early 20th century. But Juhayman very much followed in his grandfather's footsteps, as he, Sultan bin Bajad, rebelled against the House of Saud. His grandfather wanted to extend Saudi rule beyond Arabia, and launched raids into Jordan, Iraq and Kuwait, but the new king wanted to focus on state building. Plus, the new king had entered into negotiations with the British, something that Sultan bin Bajad thought was sinful. So he rebelled unsuccessfully, and was arrested. His grandson, Juaymin, saw the House of Saud continuing to act sinfully as the 20th century progressed, by allowing foreign troops in the country, and generally westernizing. In 1977, he was arrested for protesting against the government, but was released when they deemed him not to be a threat. But in prison, he met Muhammad Abdullah al Qatani. Juayman then apparently had visions from God, which proclaimed al Qatami to be the redeemer of Islam, or the Mahdi, and it was up to them to kick out the House of Saud and prepare the world for the coming of the apocalypse. So Juayman promptly married the sister of the new Mahdi, and both began to preach in order to gain followers. Now you may well have heard of the Mahdi before, if you've ever looked into British exploits in Africa. In Sudan, they fought the Mahdist wars against Muhammad Ahmad and his followers after he rebelled against the Egyptians and wanted to rid the world of evil, corruption and the likes. So the Mahdi is just a title, but there is nothing in the Quran about it, only in the Hadiths. In one, they claim that the Prophet said, After me, the Caliphate will rule. After the Caliphs, the Emirs will come, followed by kings, and after them tyrants and oppressors will rule. Then the Mahdi will reappear. Like the Christian apocalypse, there will be a number of signs that will precede the Mahdi, like a mountain of gold will appear in the Euphrates, 
and most people will die fighting over it. Or a sort of demonic figure known as Sufyani will arrive in Damascus and spread corruption and evil across the land. Others believe one third of the world will then be killed by war, while another third is killed by disease. But the number of signs that predict the end of the world in Islam is near endless. If you'd like to worry about it, well, Musnad Ahmad wrote, Before the final hour, commerce will increase until a woman helps her husband in business. Others say it will come when people accept music, or, according to Sahih Bukhari, till the people compete with one another in constructing high buildings. Otherwise, there's the idea that various parts of the world will sink, people will follow false prophets, the sky will go dark and the likes. But one of the most important ideas is that many Muslims will be Muslim in name only. They will begin to accept non-Islamic ideas, decorate the mosques and generally act sinfully. Then, when the time comes, they will actually fight against the Mahdi. Then, to go along with the idea of the Mahdi, there's also the Mujadid, which means renewal. This comes from a hadith which says, Allah will rise for this community at the end of every 100 years, the one who will renovate its religion for it. So, at the end of every century, according to the Islamic calendar, a number of people either claimed to be, or was said to be, the Mujadis, like Suleiman the Magnificent, Tamlane, and Aurangzeb. So, going off this belief, Juhamein plotted to seize Mecca on the 20th of November, 1979, or New Year's Day 1400 on the Islamic calendar. They had got supporters from across the Islamic world, some incredibly wealthy ones included, which allowed them to arm themselves. This group was the JSM, and they had many sympathizers within the National Guard, which Juhamein actually used to be part of. The soldiers who sympathized with them helped the group smuggle weapons, supplies, and even gas masks into the mosque, hiding them in the underground rooms. Then, on the morning of the attack, the group attended morning prayers, hiding their weapons under their clothes. More weapons were hidden inside coffins, which were handed out to the few hundred followers of the Mahdi. And then, they chained the gates to the mosque shut, and trapped thousands of people inside. Some of the 50,000 or so hostages couldn't speak Arabic, so were obviously shocked to see violence in Mecca. Plus, they would also have been incredibly confused when, over loudspeakers, it was proclaimed, Fellow Muslims, we announce today the coming of the Mahdi, who shall reign with justice and fairness on earth, after it had been filled with injustice and oppression. Countless visions have testified to the coming of the Mahdi. The rebels then took up defensive positions with snipers on the minarets, and drove back the first attempts to retake the mosque, led by security officers. Communication lines were cut, and nobody was aware of the scale of what had taken place. But, as news slowly began to filter out, rumors began to spread. The Americans blamed the newly installed Islamic Republic of Iran, while the Iranians blamed the Americans and the Zionists. Plus, Iran's accusations that America was attacking the holiest city of Islam led to Muslim protests and riots around the world, like in Turkey, Bangladesh, and the UAE. In Pakistan and Libya, they even attacked the American embassies and burnt them to the ground. Many of the Saudi royals were abroad, so their response was slow. But really, they faced a major problem. Violence in the ground mosque was forbidden, so the army had to wait for Islamic clerics to give them permission to attack. Then there was renovation being done, and any large-scale explosion could have caused the ground of the Kaaba to give way. This means the army was only allowed to use flashbang weapons initially, hoping it would give their soldiers cover while they scale the walls. But they were driven back. Meanwhile, inside the mosque, the JSM were burning carpets and tires in order to produce smoke to hide their movements from above. After the government lost many men in small-scale assaults, finally, on the 23rd, a fatwa was issued from the clerics, giving the army permission to fight. So, the army attacked, and the fighting became even more fierce. Anti-tank guided missiles shot at the rebels in the minarets, while many died in hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the courtyards of the mosque. The alleged Mahdi believed that he was invincible, and initially he was proved right. He apparently stepped out into open fire, and his clothes were riddled with holes from gunshots, but he survived. However, his luck eventually ran out, and many seeing him die, gave up the fight. Others continued though, they just retreated back into the labyrinths of the mosque, which contained hundreds of underground rooms. Here the fighting continued for days. The mosque was filling up with rotting corpses, and the rebels were quickly running out of food, but they continued to fight. So, the Saudis approached the French for help, and they sent the GIGN. This group of elite French policemen had been created after the Munich Massacre of 1973, and now they were in Mecca, 
a town which Muslims are only allowed into. There are therefore two stories around how the French got involved. One says that the French just trained the Saudis outside of Mecca, where they devised a plan. But historian Lawrence Wright said that they formally converted to Islam before moving in. Nevertheless, their plan was simple. Drill holes underground and gas out the rebels. Drill holes into the basements from above and throw gas bombs and grenades below. This killed a number of hostages, but was successful in pushing the rebels out into open spaces for them to be picked off by snipers. The plan therefore worked and the rebels gave up after a couple weeks of fighting. Jewayman, along with 60 of his followers, were killed in public executions held across the country. Among the executed were 41 Saudis, 10 Egyptians, 7 Yemeni, 3 Kuwaitis, an Iraqi and a Sudanese man. Plus there were also allegedly two African Americans, whose names have been kept from the public and they could well have been sent to prison along with most of the other followers. Strangely though, Jewayman was probably the victor of this whole thing. This is because almost immediately, the Saudi royals became far more conservative, hoping that by becoming incredibly religious themselves, they'd stop any further religious uprisings. So they banned women from television and segregated genders in nearly all parts of society. They closed cinemas, music shops and stopped teaching many non-Islamic classes at school. Even the current crown prince Mohammed bin Salman agrees with this, saying that before the siege of Mecca, we were living a normal life, like the rest of the Gulf countries. Women were driving cars, there were movie theatres in Saudi Arabia. So Jewayman's dreams came true. Plus, one observer of the whole event was Bin Laden, who witnessed tanks going into the holy city and later said that the Saudi government desecrated the Haram when the crisis could have been solved peacefully. This proved to be a sort of final nail in the coffin for his allegiance to the Saudi state, and he too would later see them acting sinfully. But his family was involved in other ways. For instance, his father was in charge of renovating the mosque at the time, and apparently, some of his construction workers helped ferry weapons into the mosque initially in exchange for pay. But on the other side, the Bin Laden family provided the government with blueprints of the mosque during the final assault. So the siege of Mecca stirred up anti-American sentiment abroad, made the Saudi government more conservative, and helped push Bin Laden on his path towards terrorism. But Mecca has probably seen more destruction after the siege. Since the 1980s, it has been estimated that 95% of Mecca's historic buildings have been destroyed to make way for luxury hotels, apartments, and even car parks. For instance, a Hilton hotel now stands on the site of the House of Abu Bakir, Muhammad's successor to all of the Sunnis, while the home of Muhammad's first wife was bulldozed and a public toilet was put in its place. But I'll leave it there for today, and my question to you is, can you think of any more strange groups that believe that the world was going to come to an end? Leave them in the comments below.